The Road to Wigan Pier by George Orwell The Road to Wigan Pier is a book by the English writer George Orwell. First published in 1937. The first half of this work documents his sociological investigations of the bleak living conditions among the working class in Lancashire and Yorkshire in the industrial north of England before World War II. The second half is a long essay on his middle-class upbringing and the development of his political conscience, questioning British attitudes towards socialism. Orwell states plainly that he himself is in favor of socialism, but feels it necessary to point out reasons why many people who would benefit from socialism and should logically support it are in practice likely to be strong opponents. According to Orwell biographer Bernard Crick, publisher Victor Golanch first tried to persuade Orwell's agent to allow the left book club edition to consist solely of the descriptive first half of the book. When this was refused Golanch wrote an introduction to the book. Victor could not bear to reject it, even though his suggestion that the repugnant second half should be omitted from the club edition was turned down. On this occasion Victor albeit nervously, did overrule Communist Party objections in favor of his publishing instinct. His compromise was to publish the book with an introduction full of good criticism, unfair criticism, and half-truths. The book grapples with the social and historical reality of depression suffering in the north of England, Dash Orwell does not wish merely to enumerate evils and injustices but to break through what he regards as middle-class oblivion. Orwell's corrective to such falsity comes first by immersion of his own body. A supreme measure of truth for Orwell? Directly into the experience of misery. Structure. The book is divided into two sections. Part 1. George Orwell set out to report on working-class life in the bleak industrial heartlands of the West Midlands, Yorkshire, and Lancashire. He spent his time living among the people and as such his descriptions are detailed and vivid. Chapter 1 describes the life of the Brooker family, a more wealthy example of the northern working class. They have a shop and cheap lodging house in their home. Orwell describes the old people who live in the home and their living conditions. Chapter 2 describes the life of miners and conditions down a coal mine. Orwell describes how he went down a coal mine to observe proceedings and he explains how the coal is distributed. The working conditions are very poor. This is the part of the book most often quoted. Chapter 3 describes the social situation of the average miner. Hygienic and financial conditions are discussed. Orwell explains why most miners do not actually earn as much as they are sometimes believed to. Chapter 4 describes the housing situation in the industrial north. There is a housing shortage in the region and therefore people are more likely to accept substandard housing. The housing conditions are very poor. Chapter 5 explores unemployment and Orwell explains that the unemployment statistics of the time are misleading. Chapter 6 deals with the food of the average miner and how. Although they generally have enough money to buy food, most families prefer to buy something tasty to enrich their dull lives. This leads to malnutrition and physical degeneration in many families. Chapter 7 describes the ugliness of the industrial towns in the north of England. Part 2 In contrast to the straightforward documentary of the first part of the book, in Part 2 Orwell discusses the relevance of socialism to improving living conditions. This section proved controversial. Orwell sets out his initial premises very simply. Are the appalling conditions described in part one tolerable? No. Is socialism wholeheartedly applied as a world system capable of improving those conditions? Yes. Why then are we not all socialists? The rest of the book consists of Orwell's attempt to answer this difficult question. 
He points out that most people who argue against socialism do not do so because of straightforward selfish motives, or because they do not believe that the system would work. But for more complex emotional reasons, which, according to Orwell, most socialists misunderstand. He identifies five main problems. Class prejudice. This is real and it is visceral. Middle class socialists do themselves no favors by pretending it does not exist and by glorifying the manual worker. They tend to alienate the large section of the population that is economically working class but culturally middle class. Machine worship. Orwell finds most socialists guilty of this. Orwell himself is suspicious of technological progress for its own sake and thinks it inevitably leads to softness and decadence. He points out that most fictional technically advanced socialist utopias are deadly dull. H. G. Wells in particular is criticized on these grounds. Crankiness. Among many other types of people Orwell specifies people who have beards or wear sandals, vegetarians, and nudists as contributing to socialism's negative reputation among many more conventional people. Turgid language. Those who pepper their sentences with notwithstandings and heretofores and become overexcited when discussing dialectical materialism are unlikely to gain much popular support. Failure to concentrate on the basics. Socialism should be about common decency and fair shares for all rather than political orthodoxy or philosophical consistency. In presenting these arguments Orwell takes on the role of devil's advocate. He states very plainly that he himself is in favor of socialism but feels it necessary to point out reasons why many people, who would benefit from socialism, and should logically support it are in practice likely to be strong opponents. Orwell's publisher, Victor Golanch, was so concerned that these passages would be misinterpreted, and that the mostly middle class, members of the left book club would be offended. That he added a foreword in which he raises some caveats about Orwell's claims in part two. He suggests, for instance, that Orwell may exaggerate the visceral contempt that the English middle classes hold for the working class, adding, however, that I may be a bad judge of the question, for I am a Jew, and passed the years of my early boyhood in a fairly close Jewish community, and, among Jews of this type, class distinctions do not exist. Other concerns Golanch raises are that Orwell should so instinctively dismiss movements such as pacifism or feminism as incompatible with or counterproductive to the socialist cause and that Orwell relies too much upon a poorly defined, emotional concept of socialism. Golanch claims that Orwell does not once define what he means by socialism in the road to Wigan Pier. The foreword does not appear in some modern editions of the book. Though it was included, for instance, in Harcourt Brace Yovanovitch's first American edition in the 1950s. At a later date Golanch published part one on its own, against Orwell's wishes. And he refused to publish homage to Catalonia at all. End of the topic.